In video number 48, I discussed the basics of MQTT as an extension for the layout control bus. As it seems, MQTT is a simple but powerful protocol to open up model railroad layouts to the rapidly developing Internet of Things. However, at this point, there are significant differences between the message structures of applications. So I left you with the question about your views for how to structure layout control messages into MQTT topics and payloads. Today I am going to outline my reasoning for selecting a single topic and raw data payload structure for my Loconet and Open LCB to MQTT gateways. Welcome to the IOTT channel, I am Hans Tanner. First, I want to thank you all for the many comments and answers to the questions raised in the last video, either in the comment section below the video or in the MQTT4 model railroader discussion group on groups.io. I thought it was a really interesting and insightful discussion that went far beyond my original discussion topics. In this follow-up video, I will review some of the remarks and concerns from the discussions following the last video, give a little more detail about the topic and message structure I chose for the Loconet to MQTT gateway and discuss the reasoning behind my selection and why I think for this particular application it is the best fit. In video number 48, I outlined three application fields where MQTT, in my opinion, provides real advantages. Adding standard IoT components to make them work in a model railroad layout context. Provide a gateway for a simple implementation of additional logic, for example, routing, signaling and train control in more powerful network structures. And Providing an infrastructure to implement gateways between control systems from different manufacturers. No surprise, most of the discussion contributions either fall into one of these three categories or are of a more general nature, for example MQTT performance or questions around networking. One question that came up right away was what happens if the internet is not working? Well. My demonstrations provided in the last video made use of the internet and public MQTT servers because I wanted you to have something you can play with. But for a local layout control implementation the internet is not needed. A meaningful minimum infrastructure is a Wi-Fi router for the MQTT devices to connect to. The router can but does not have to have an internet connection. The other component you need is a computer running an MQTT broker and a gateway for the message exchange between layout and Wi-Fi. That's it. Another general concern was regarding the capacity of the Wi-Fi network to handle all the messages from the layout. Well, in the case of Loconet, I don't think this is ever going to be a problem, as typical Wi-Fi is more than 3500 times faster than Loconet, so there is ample capacity for repeated messages including protocol overhead. In the case of OpenLCB with its message bursts when a new node joins the network, that might be a valid concern. However, Wi-Fi is still around 100 times faster than a 500 kV USB serial interface which also appears to be able to receive those open LCB message bursts. So I am not overly concerned, but this is something to look into a bit more in the future. Also an interesting question was this. What happens when two nodes issue a command at practically the same time? One for setting a switch to closed, the other for setting it to thrown. Of course, the short answer is the same as when you do it just within the layout control system. The switch goes first to one and shortly thereafter to the other position. However, there are two things I would like to point out. First, when adding an MQTT extension, we need to make sure to maintain the star configuration of the network. This is already important when doing a standard layout network. There should be no loops in the control bus. 
with a gateway we introduce latency to the messages. So if we have a second gateway or for example a gateway to JM or I computer that along with an USB port can constitute a message loop, we can have messages going in a circle forever. So maintaining a star configuration is key. Luckily the broker centered structure of MQTT is very supportive in doing that. The second point relates to layout control networks with incomplete implementation of the OC network layers, in particular Loconet. The Loconet standard neither provides data link nor network layers. In short, that means that messages are sent without delivery confirmation and the sender address of messages is not known. This becomes a problem in case of messages that trigger a reply message from the recipient. In a physical Loconet, this problem is solved because the recipient of such a message keeps Loconet busy until it is ready to send the reply. If time is too long, it even sends a busy opcode to make sure no other node is able to access the network. When now sending two messages that trigger a reply from two different MQTT nodes practically at the same time, we can no longer assign the incoming replies to the correct sender of the original message because we don't know which one was sent first and we can't necessarily match the reply with the original request. To fix that I added a request ID to the MQTT message sent to the gateway. Since the gateway transmits to the physical Loconet it can match request and reply and then returns the reply with the same request ID. As you see here in the node read message log. And it does that even if there were some busy messages in between. In fact, each busy opcode gets assigned the same request ID. So yes, message sequencing is indeed something to keep an eye on. Not so much for racing conditions as brought up in the initial comment, but because of an incomplete implementation of the network layers in Loconet. The same thing, by the way, should not be an issue for an open LCB to MQTT gateway, as the CAN bus has a complete network implementation, which in my opinion is a real plus in that case. Several comments to the video were about adding standard hardware to the layout control system, for example to switch off and on room lights from a throttle. One viewer mentioned the HA components or Home Assistant components which is a set of Node-RED components that provide easy access to common devices. The simplest and cheapest way I know to switch AC lines are the Sonoff modules. For example applications, check out my videos number 5 and 26 where I used Sonoffs for my reflow oven and my landscaping lights. They are available for about $6 a piece and have a single pole relay activated by an ESP8266 so they can connect to Wi-Fi. The programming pins of the ESP8266 are accessible so it is easy to reflash them with whatever software you like and best of all with Tasmota there is a very powerful software available that makes the Sonoff an MQTT device. All you then need to do is putting up a function node in node red that listens to Loconet commands and when the particular switch command comes in, issue a message to the Sonoff to switch the relay accordingly. Real simple. And much more is possible once you start digging into that subject. Several viewers made comments about using Node-RED as a simple programming tool on the MQTT side. For example to execute switch and signal logic. An interesting topic that came up in that context was route locking, in other words protecting a set route against accidentally changing switch positions or signal aspects before the train is passing by. This is not really a typical MQTT topic as it applies to any system where a particular switch or signal can be set from more than one location. It even is an issue in real railroads and the solutions to prevent errors typically range from proper training of personnel over organizational measures to technical locking, either via software or even physical locks. From a technical point of view, 
I think it is important to keep in mind that it is not possible to introduce locking mechanisms and the like on the MQTT level if they are not supported by the command control system hardware. The minimum infrastructure required for route protection would therefore be a position sensor on each turnout so that the manual change of the turnout position by an operator could be detected. A noteworthy mechanism to prevent accidental setting of switches is the so-called Bushby bit, named after fellow model railroader Strat Bushby. This bit is available in Digitrax systems. When set, it causes the command station to ignore switch requests commands, therefore switches can no longer be operated from handheld throttles. To operate a switch when the Bushby bit is activated, a switch acknowledge command is required instead, which can be sent from a local switchboard or a node red function node. That is a simple and effective way to provide some additional security when doing logic modules in node red. One thing that did not come up in the discussion but is of importance, I think, is the fact that Node-RED is a single user system. Yes, it runs in a client-server model, so you can access the Node-RED screen from every computer in the network, but every screen shows an image of the same resources. So when you set an input field on one computer, it will be the same on all computers. For example, in my Loconet toolbox, I have a switchboard to send switch commands. I can open it on all of my connected computers or cell phones, but when I select a particular switch address on one of the screens, it will be replicated to all screens. For resources that are unique, that is beneficial. For example, for the service mode programming track. For others, for example for a throttle, it is less convenient as you would like to control different locomotives on different throttles. However, while looking into this problem, I found a nice workaround. Node-RED also exists as a cell phone app for Android called Red Light. Unfortunately, it does not look like it is available for the iPhone at this time. When you install it and the phone is hooked up to your Wi-Fi, you can call the screen from your computer and easily copy Node-RED nodes from the computer over to the Node-RED installation on the cell phone and then run them on the Node-RED of the phone. That is a very effective way of converting cell phones to throttles. As you can see here, I just did a quick and dirty throttle implementation in Node-RED for the cell phone. Of course, the look and feel can be improved. For the moment, I just wanted to know if it works and it does. All that is needed is a gateway and a broker, and one cell phone for each throttle. No limit to a particular number of throttles, and depending on cell phone and Wi-Fi router, you can move the throttles to the 5 GHz bands of the Wi-Fi, which helps with traffic in the 2.4 GHz band. I plan on doing one of the next videos on an upgraded version of the Loconet toolbox from video number 6, and show how to run it on a cell phone. So, if you are interested in this, it is a good idea to subscribe to the IOTT channel and hit the bell icon so you have a premium seat when that video comes out. The third area of advantages, bridging between systems, has not triggered that many comments so far. It seems right now that bridging to other systems like home automation is more popular than bridging to other digital command control systems. However, at the core it is the same. It is a simple translation of topics and payloads of one system to topics and payloads of the other system and vice versa. Which brings us back to my original question. What should be part of the topic and what should be part of the payload? Essentially this comes down to the question is it better to translate system messages into a universal language at the gateway and then use some sort of model railroad Esperanto within the MQTT network? Or is it better to keep the raw messages of the original digital command control system just packed up into an MQTT payload 
and leave the interpretation of the messages to the individual function nodes that process the messages. Before I explain why I opted for the second concept, let me quickly explain how the messages of my Loconet to MQTT gateway are structured. In a nutshell, the gateway uses just one single user configurable broadcast topic with a JSON string as payload. However, this is not what I used in the first implementation, but rather the result of a few development cycles. The original structure as used in video number one consisted of separate topics for incoming and outgoing messages. When transmitting to Loconet, a device would publish the message using the out topic. The gateway would then send the message to Loconet and return the echo as incoming message, which then would be distributed by the broker to all attached devices. I called this Loconet mode at the time. In video number four, I then introduced the new network mode, which only used one single topic for both outgoing and incoming messages. In order to still maintain the possibility of getting a confirmation from the gateway when a message was sent, I also introduced the echo topic. The advantage of the network mode was direct communication between MQTT nodes. The disadvantage is that the sequencing of messages is no longer guaranteed. Video number 4 has a nice animation discussing the differences in detail, starting around 8 minutes and 15 seconds into the video. As time went on, I figured that network mode was the better option overall and therefore quietly skipped the Loconet mode when I converted the gateway from ESP8266 to ESP32 for video number 9, and after that the topic structure remained unchanged. Going forward, I may look into eliminating the echo topic as it turns out it is not really needed. The payload also went through several development steps. Originally, outgoing messages just had sender and data. Later on, I added a valid attribute which was intended to signal the difference between outgoing and incoming messages when changing to network mode. It turned out to be useless, as the same can be achieved by checking the sender address and looking into the error flags attribute, which would signal errors like failed XO check or missing data bytes from the gateway to the MQTT participants. More important was the introduction of the request ID parameter for the reasons explained earlier in this video. So this slide shows the payload structure as it is currently being used. Real payloads still have some of the older attributes, but they will be eliminated in the future. And this actually demonstrates another advantage of MQTT. It is pretty insensitive to version changes as new attributes can be added anytime. Older versions of the software will simply ignore them. So, why did I choose this topic and payload structure over more detailed and complex variants? And by the way, let me make clear that I do not think that there is an absolute right or wrong for this. And with the flexibility provided by tools like Node-RED, that allow for quick and easy conversion from one format to another, the need for standardization on the message level remains low. For me, the determining factor is the nature of the data that is being sent back and forth. So let's have a look at the typical data model of a model railroad control system. At the core we have two data categories, trackside data and trainside data. And a minor category besides that would be system administration data, but that's not used for train operations. Trackside data consists of switch data, block detector data and signal data. And we could also add something like other input data for buttons and the like, even though in most cases button feedback probably is given via block detector data. Trainside data consists of speed and function information for locomotives and function cars. That's basically it. So it is relatively simple. 
Also the message structure as used by the command control system is normally quite straightforward and even more importantly the attributes of each data object are generally also kept together in the control messages. We deal with block detector data messages normally consisting of the address of the block detector and the status or switch messages normally consisting of the switch address and the position or signal messages normally consisting of the signal address and the aspect value or locomotive data normally consisting of local address and speed and functions and so on. So the data structure is simple. Data generation and usage typically includes the full data object so I cannot see a reason for splitting it up and that's why I went for the single topic and raw data payload approach for this level. Now looking further up the model this may change. The next level on the track side is the track system layer where block detectors, switches and signals are combined to track sections or as I called them in video number 24 security elements. And then on the next layer the track side and the train side are brought together so that we can move trains over configured tracks either manually or following a timetable. Typically these higher levels are not supported by the digital command control system which means two things. First we are free to define our own object and function, function structure and second in case of distributed logic over several nodes we cannot send object specific information through the command control system network. We are forced to build a parallel network if we do for example track configuration on one machine and timetable execution on another. And that is the area where in my opinion a more complex topic and payload structure becomes useful. Let me give you an example from the ABS signaling algorithm I am currently implementing in the IoT stick as part of the security element handler. If we have two consecutive track sections each protected by a signal, the aspect of the first section should be one level higher than the aspect of the second section. If the second section shows stop, the first should show approach. If the second shows approach, the first should show slow and so on. As long as both security elements are modeled in the same IoT stick, this is not a problem. I just keep track of the aspect changes of both signals and use the status of the second signal to set the first, of course along with some other information. But now let's assume this is a modular layout and the two security elements are on two different modules and each module has its own IoT stick to control the security elements of that particular module. This is a problem because I cannot interrogate the status of the signal of the second track section via Loconet as there are no commands to request the aspect of a signal and that's where I will use another group of MQTT topics to communicate. So essentially I am setting up a new message pipeline for messages that cannot be handled in Loconet and from a logical point of view it is a parallel wire to the existing communication line so to speak. But as I am working on this right now this is material for a future video. And that's it for today. I hope this information was useful or at least interesting for you and provides you with some more ideas how you can benefit from MQTT to control your model railroad layout. If so, please click the like button below to let me know. Thanks for watching and see you next time.